The Lord be with you. And also with you. Well, you have survived the beginning of daylight savings time, and you're here. So pat yourself on the back. And all those people that come wandering in at quarter of 11, you can look at them with a haughty derision. Where have you been? We're we're glad that you're all here, and we're glad that you're watching on TV from wherever you are. Several announcements this morning. One is, of course, we have a congregational meeting right after the benediction, and we'll talk about that then. We got uh, a word from Mimi Michaels in Guatemala with the microloan team. Their visit is going well. They're having lots of good inter- interactions with a lot of people. She was able to see some people from our sister church at dinner on Friday. And it was wonderful, except that Timoteo Rodas is doing very poorly. He's got a liver disease, I think, and um, he's not doing well at all. So we're asked to continue to pray for him and for all the people of El Redentor uh, during this time. We also have some announcements from Mr. Mission, Bob Nell. Good morning. I am here again representing the Council on Sharing, previously known as the Missions Committee. I wanted to uh, call your attention to several mission projects that are ongoing at this moment in time. Most of the information is found in the newsletter, uh, which is published monthly. I hope you're all receiving the newsletter either through the mail or in your email and that you're taking time to, uh, to browse through that. Kim does a great job in putting our newsletter together. But several items here I'd like to to highlight. Uh, We will be hosting a Red Cross blood drive in our fellowship hall on Tuesday, March 26th from 2.30 p.m. until 7 p.m. You can go to the Red Cross uh, blood drive and sign up for an appointment or you can walk in. They have streamlined the process a bit and uh, the wait is not nearly as long as it used to be. The need for blood, as always, continues and is great. And we hope to make our goal at this, uh, at this drive. We would also welcome volunteers to work uh, the snack table where folks come over after they've donated and also some folks to uh, register the, the donors when they come in. Just work about a two hour shift or so. If you can uh, interested in doing that, please uh, get in touch with myself or Kim and we'd be glad to, uh, glad to have you. Also, we'd love to have some homemade desserts. Uh, our church is known for having good snacks at our blood drives, so uh, if you want to make a pie or some cookies, that'd be wonderful too. On Saturday, April the 20th, we will uh, again host a Rise Against Hunger packing event uh, in the Fellowship Hall, once again working with our friends at Beth Eden Lutheran Church. We plan to uh, pack 20,000 meals in two and a half hours. And those of you who have taken part in this, I think this will be our fourth or possibly fifth event. You know it's a lot of fun. There's jobs for every age and ability. There's sit-down jobs and stand-up jobs. We have uh, a group of youth from Riverbend Middle School and the youth from our churches will be there to do the heavy lifting. So. Registration for that is very simple. It's all done all online in our uh, newsletter and also on the table in the narthex and in Kim's office. There's a little piece of paper that has the sign up link and it's very simple to do that. If you need help signing up, uh, just call Kim and she'll, she'll take care of the uh, online process. Also in the narthex are four boxes to donate our annual March Madness food drive, Go Duke, uh, to benefit a sure ministry which is formerly known as ETRICM. Canned and packaged food goods would be uh, welcomed and also financial donations would, uh, would be great. For each dollar given, I believe you get three points and for each pound of food you get two points. So 
either of those would be a good way to, uh, to donate to that. Details for this effort will be in the announcement section in the bulletin. Go Duke. <laughs> and finally, you will notice the gallon peach cans here at the front of the sanctuary. These are for the collection of the daily change offering, which is collected at churches throughout the PWMC. Uh, collections for this offering go to support hunger programs, both locally, uh, regionally, and internationally. In recent years, the monies have supported the corner table, the backpack program, and the health programs in our partnership uh, with our churches in Guatemala. During the first hymn, you're invited to come up and make a donation to the cans there. If you'd like to learn more about what the activities of the Council on Sharing, we are meeting tomorrow, Monday, the second Monday of the month at 4 p.m. We changed our time to allow some folks to join us that, uh, that are working and uh, be in the Presbyterian women's room out on the hall. Uh, we would love to have you, have you join us. We want to thank uh, Beth Huggins for riding the chair for the last year. Uh, she, and, <laughs> she and Brad are going to be moving out of the community here in a few weeks, and we appreciate uh, their efforts in, that in our committee and also look forward to them coming back and visit with us. So that would do it. Thank you very much. Please stand in body or spirit and let's join together in a call for worship. We give you thanks, O oh God, for your good, your steadfast love endures forever. We cry to you with our troubles, O oh Lord. You saved us from our distress. We give you thanks, O oh God, for your wonderful works to all humanity. Hear now our offerings of praise and thanksgiving as we tell you your deeds with songs of joy. Let us worship God. 
and let us join in a prayer of praise and adoration. God of infinite goodness and mercy, we cannot escape from your presence. Your promise remains with us in every situation. When we are desolate, your spirit comes to comfort us. Amid our tribulation, your chosen one remains our firm hope. We can sing your song in whatever land we find our abode. We shall forever give thanks for the gift of your grace. You are God who never forsakes us. To you be glory and praise now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> And so giving thanks to God, let us confess our sins. Let us pray. O oh God, in Christ Jesus, you proclaimed your love for all creation. Have mercy on us as we confess our sin. We have overpopulated the earth and violated its goodness. We have depleted nature of its vital resources. Pollution besets us. Waters lie stagnant. We care not for ourselves as temples, nor for communities as buildings not built with hands. We plead for forgiveness and ask for your guidance. 
Help us to be disciplined in taking care of your gifts, lest in neglecting them we lose them forever. Amen. steadfast love of God endures forever, so believe the good news in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Amen. First scripture lesson today is from Acts chapter 1, verses 21 to 26. You can follow it in your pew Bible on page 118. So now we must choose someone else to take Jesus' place and to join us as witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. Let us select someone who has been with us constantly from our first association with the Lord from the time he was baptized by John until the day he was taken from us into heaven. The assembly nominated two men, Joseph Justus, also called Barsabbas, and Matthias. Then they all prayed for the right man to be chosen. O Lord, they said, you know every heart. Show us which of these men you have chosen as an apostle to replace Judas the traitor who has gone on to his proper place. Then they drew straws, and in this manner Matthias was chosen and became an apostle with the other eleven. Thanks be to God.
if all the children and youth will join me up front for Time for Young Disciples. Well, Laura is homesick, watching from home, and she wanted us to wave to her. Hi, Laura. So, got <laughs> some sticks. Sticks. And I think you're the oldest, so I'm going to let you see if you can break this stick with your hands. He's so strong. Parker, what did you think of that? You're strong too. Oh, okay, yeah. Woo! Okay, so can you, let's see if, can you break that stick? You want to see if you can break that stick? Yeah. See if you can break that stick. It's hard. Oh, she got that one broke. You need help. So let somebody help you. Okay, then the smaller it gets, the harder it gets. Okay, now, you think you can break all of these sticks? Okay. But how about turning around so everybody can see? Try, we'll let everybody, no, don't turn them out. Let's keep them together. See if you can break all these. Ugh. No. No, not using your feet. No. See if Madeline could do it. Okay. I don't think we can break it. So this one stick we can break. But when they're all together as one big bundle of sticks, you can't we can't do it, can we? Because they are stronger all together. No, we're not going to undo it because we need them to stay strong. And guess what? Each one of these sticks represents somebody here in church. So the, the more we have them all together, the stronger they are. Just like whenever, like some people say, I don't need to go to church. I, I'm spiritual. I, I believe in Jesus and I don't need to go to church. But... Jesus said we come together as one body of sticks or people and we become stronger in our faith. Just like at Sunday Community Supper, it's not just us, our church, doing Sunday Community Supper like this Sunday. Trinity Baptist Church has Sunday Community Supper. So each one of these sticks could be all the different churches or groups in our community. So this will be stronger if we stay all together. All right. So if you're going to be joining me for blast, we'll go to the back here in a minute. All right. So join me in prayer. Can you get ready for prayer? Okay. Repeat after me. Father, protect us. Father, protect us. And help us to be one with other believers to be one with other believers, just as you are one with Jesus. Amen. We're going to read from 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7. The saying is sure, whoever aspires to the office of bishop desires a noble task. Now a bishop must be above reproach, married only once, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, an apt teacher, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. 
He must manage his own household well, keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace and the snare of the devil. This is the word of the Lord. And we turn to the Barman Declaration once again. In section four, it says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great men exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. The various offices in the church do not establish a dominion of some over the others. On the contrary, they are for the exercise of the ministry entrusted to and enjoined upon the whole congregation. We reject the false doctrine as though the church, apart from this ministry, could and were permitted to give to itself or allow to be given to it special leaders vested with ruling powers. So this part of the Barman Declaration focuses on the church. Now, at this point, the German church had been kind of co-opted by the Nazi rulers. And Bart is clearly speaking to them. But he does so in a way that has deniability. Oh, no, we weren't talking about the government. We were talking about the little old church. We wouldn't dare talk about the government. We're just talking about the church. And I think, as I read this, that Bart was looking at the Presbyterians over his shoulder. I mean, the Lutherans kept the Episcopal system of bishops, like the Roman Catholics. And that system has a person who oversees all the churches in a region, and then another person who oversees all of those people, and another one until it gets way up to the Pope. Presbyterians don't have bishops. Remember what I said John Calvin wrote, though? He thought they were a good idea if he could ever find one who wasn't corrupted. So Presbyterians don't have bishops. We have ever higher levels of courts. We have the session. We have the presbytery. A bunch of presbyteries make up a synod. And all the synods together make up the General Assembly. So we have more people the higher you go instead of fewer. It's a little like the U.S. government. You have local government, state government, and then the national government. Most of the people in the early early part of this country in the government were Presbyterian. It might not surprise you. And the British referred to the revolution as that Presbyterian rebellion. Well, the key part of this section, I think, is the phrase that says, the ministry entrusted to and enjoined upon the whole congregation. And so the question is, what is that ministry for us at this time in this place? That's an interesting question as you face my retirement. I will leave, but the congregation will remain. And the work of the congregation, its mission and its ministry, will continue. And there'll be all kinds of things that happen to make all that happen. I was explaining that process to one session the night that I told him I was moving. And one of the elders said, so this interim pastor will bring the prescription for what's wrong with us before he even meets us and gets to know us. I said, well, that's true. 
At least the bad ones will. The good ones will get to know you and then give you the prescription, probably tailored for your situation. Well, the interim pastor is supposed to keep the lights on and the programs going and and lead worship until a new pastor is called. You may not like the interim pastor, or you might love them. Either way, they're temporary. But the interim pastor who's doing his job has five tasks that he tries to get the congregation to work on. And those five tasks are coming to terms with the past. Why did David leave us? What's wrong with him? What's wrong with us? Something must be wrong. There's nothing wrong here. Second one is discovering a new identity. So that's answering the question, who are we and who are we going to be? Third one is shifts of power. I saw this one so clearly when the senior pastor retired. People that used to just march into his office and shut the door and tell him what he was going to do suddenly had no one who would do what they said because the interim pastor just would smile and say thank you and not do it. And new leadership arose. It was terrifying. Rethinking denominational heritage and links. That's the fourth task. And you will find the presbytery an able, helpful partner in what you do. And finally, commitment to new leadership and a new future. You'll call a new pastor. It may take some time, but it will happen. And that's what the interim pastor's job is to guide you through. You know, it can be depressing to look at our history. One time you had a congregation that was spilling out of the chapel, chairs in the aisle. We were joking this morning that, you know, they should make the announcement in the event that the building catches on fire, let the people in the aisle grab their chairs and run out first so the rest of you don't trip over a chair and die. Well... They're spilling out of the chapel. So you built this big, beautiful sanctuary. And then, of course, the economy tanked. Industry left town. So people left town. What's there to do in Newton, right? And a few years later, all the children graduated from high school, and we went from a great big youth group to three or four kids. It's growing now, but it's not what it was yet. And some families left this congregation to go find one that had more youth. So fewer people are here trying to keep this large building running. This is an opportunity, though. You have this great space. You have the finest pipe organ in the area. You have coming a new and enthusiastic choir director to take up the mantle that Kathy Murdoch will lay aside in three weeks. Wow. And so he will continue this congregation's commitment to musical excellence. So it's an opportunity, not a crisis. So what have I learned over the years? Oh, oh, here we go. Um, I have learned that you can trust your session and the presbytery. Often people who don't know much about the presbytery or the session, for that matter, think of them as enemies. They're telling us what to do. We're not going to do that. I mean, I don't know why people respond that way. The Presbytery exists to help us, and the Presbytery is us. 
it's made up of, I don't know, 90 congregations or something in this part of North Carolina. So it's, it's us. They're not an adversary. And it's the same with the session. We elect them right here in this room. They take care of all the details. Their names are on the back of the bulletin. If you have an issue, go talk to them. But there's some warnings and reflections. So first of all, avoid the personality cult. We've all seen pastors and even politicians, for that matter, who become enamored with the adoration that their fans give them. You see it on television all the time. Famous preachers who build up these empires with their pearly white fake teeth smiles. Well, that happens in local congregations too. I was uh, serving in a congregation one time where the pastor had been there 32 years. The congregation was only 36 years old, so he pretty much put his stamp on everything that happened. Whatever he said, people cheerfully did. And after his retirement was announced, the women's circle met, and one woman broke into tears. They asked her why she was crying, and she said, God doesn't answer prayers. <laughs> what do you mean? And she said, if God <laughs> answered prayers, my pastor would not be retiring. And a quick-witted woman said, maybe God answered his prayers. <laughs> that discussion ended right there. I don't want anybody worshiping at the altar of me or any other pastor. We're not that good, you know. Avoid the personality cults. Now, second, don't look too longingly at the past. It's typical for congregations to look at the past to the familiar. But I really doubt that Jody Welker is going to come back. Or Stephen, or Mark, or any of them. They're just not coming back. They've been here, they've moved on. I used to hear stories many years ago about one of my predecessors who was said to be just frankly a really bad preacher. He just didn't know what he was doing. But suddenly when the senior pastor retired, the congregation was walking around going, do you think he'll come? We could call him. And I, I would just say, tell me why. Well, they didn't have an answer. They just knew, he, they knew him. God will bring you someone with a new vision, new ideas, new energy, and a new style. And pretty soon you'll see that all is well. So look not to the past, but look to the future. And as you look around and take stock of how things are, how things have been, cherish it all, but you might decide it's time to stop doing something that no longer works or make radical changes. Early on, I heard the story of the midweek children's program and how it died when there were all these volunteers but no children. Can't have a children's program without little kids. And everyone still laments that and wrings their hands. Oh, we got to get the children's program back. Well, that would be nice. But how? We've had discussions about several different strategies. Nothing has worked, nothing has happened. I don't really have an answer, but I can tell you this. Change is simply change. It isn't bad, it isn't necessarily good. Change is change and change is inevitable. So relax and ride the changes. If you don't like how something is, change it. If it doesn't work, change it again. Just 
feel free to make changes. I went to one church where we had a DCE and she was so proud of the youth club. We had youth club every Wednesday and so I went down to the gym to see youth club and I was thinking of youth club when I was in seminary and we had gazillion kids running around the gym and there were two little boys having cookies and I said Joyce, where's the youth club? She said, oh, this is youth club. Okay. Then the children's choir director came in and greeted the boys and took them off to choir practice. And I said, two children in choir? That's, you know, not, you need some girls. Oh, they're up there. So I slipped upstairs and looked in the choir room and there were like five children in the choir but only two of them came to youth club. And I said, you know, youth club has got to be more than a snack. And she eventually agreed with me, but if something doesn't work, just change it. It'll be all right. Our God is active. And God is an active God who loves to see change happen to us, to the world and to the church. And God will be with you all the way, leading you and leading to changes. And God gave us this charge, our ministry and mission, here in Newton a long time ago. And God continues to be with us and supports us. And God will bring a new pastor here. And it will all continue in his name, and it will all be well. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's respond with an affirmation of faith from the Barman Declaration. 
We confess the following evangelical truths. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. The various offices in the church do not establish a dominion of some over the others. On the contrary, they are the exercise of the ministry entrusted to and enjoined upon the whole congregation. We reject the false doctrine as though the church, apart from this ministry, could and were permitted to give to God or to allow to be given to it special leaders vested with ruling powers. You may be seated. As we pray, let's remember Bill Clark, Leanna Reinhardt's father. He was with us in worship last week. He had surgery on his neck, his throat yesterday. Came through the surgery, the minimum of tissue removed, so he will be able to talk, and he awaits the pathology report. But the good news, I think, is that he survived, and so we give thanks to God for that. And we pray for our mission team and our partners in El Redentor, and especially for Timoteo Rodas and his family as they face his illness. Let us pray. Holy God, you are the one who leads us, who led your people through the waters and out of Egypt. You led your people through the desert and into the promised land. You led your people through the years of difficulty, through the wars, through the conquering enemies. You lead your people through all kinds of things. And so we give you thanks and praise And we give you thanks and praise especially for the life and work of Jesus Christ, your Son, who brings us new life. And in that new life, we find energy, we find a call, and we find power. And we find that we are not afraid or anxious, for he is with us at every turn. So let your spirit speak to us. Let your spirit lead us through this challenging time. Let your spirit be with us no matter what comes. Help us to see and to know that we are your church. You have called us to be here. We do give you thanks for your church in the community, for all the congregations of your church, for all the varieties of style and beliefs that they have, in spite of all the differences We are one church, serving one God, and we give you thanks for that. So we pray for our community. We pray for our world. We pray for the church in Guatemala. We pray for the Ukraine. We pray for Israel in the Near East. We pray for all the places around the world where there is fighting and war that, whose names we don't even know. We pray for them all and ask you to give us peace. 
We pray for those who serve our country overseas and in dangerous, in dangerous places. Bring them, lead them safely through the danger and bring them home. And someday, O oh God, you will bring us all home. And so we give you thanks as well for that. And all that we say and do, let us bring you honor and glory and praise. Let us bring you that honor and glory and praise in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And let us bring to God our tithes and offerings. Let us pray together. O God of boundless love, 
You restore our strength through faith in your goodness. You look with favor upon us and through Christ redeem us. You take not yourself from us, but promise your presence through the gift of your spirit. You come now from behind to push us and go before us as our guide. Accept now what we bring you in response to your encompassing care of us. Amen. So go in peace, do not be afraid or anxious, but trust the Lord God to lead you well. And as you go, may all the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you today and every day forever. Amen. You may be seated. It's one of those congregational meetings where we've got to do some things just to check off first three of 7,000 boxes that you have to check off between pastors. So let's open with the prayer. You are always with us, O oh God, but be with us especially in these few minutes and help us to understand and uh, to share our, our feelings. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the reason for this meeting, the official motion, is that I am asking the congregation to concur in my request to the Presbytery of Western North Carolina that the pastoral relationship between me and the congregation be dissolved as of May 31st, 2024, in order that I might begin my retirement. Do not panic. May 30, 31st is in there to satisfy the Board of Pensions because 
if you work three days into June, you don't get any payment until July, and we like to eat. So, so it's May 31st. But I have promised to preach June 2nd and June 9th, and I will. And um, I'll think of everything I've wanted to say over the years, and it'll be seven hours long. <laughs> There's, um, so that's the motion. Um, a word about why I'm doing this now. As I said in my note to you, um, I did have that stroke, and so, you know, and I look down the aisle, I don't see the people over here too well, or really at all, sorry. Um, and, you know, I'm getting tired, and I'm getting old, and I'm getting slow, and I thought, you know, it's just time. It just feels like it's time. I don't know if I could do another year or two. I don't know, you know, when my arteries will explode and I'll fall over dead. So let's just do it now. Um, but there's nothing wrong. There's nothing that happened. There's nothing particularly wrong with my health, ex except I had a stroke. Um, and I've got a heart thing, and I've got, you know, diabetes medicine. You know, it, it keeps getting larger, but... Um, but I'm in pretty good health, and I want to enjoy that while I can. Um, so that's why I'm doing it. There's nothing wrong with the church. And there's nothing wrong with the staff. There's nothing wrong with any of you. It's just, it's time. So with that, I want you to vote. And someone said, what if we vote no? The Presbytery will overrule you because they can. So um, I don't know what they would do exactly, but it could be fun. So anyway, there's the motion. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Then let us pray. We give you thanks, O oh God, that we can do your business uh, decently and in order. We give you thanks that we can, um, we can face the future with, with the, the knowledge that you are always with us. And so we pray that you will stay with this congregation through the coming weeks and years. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.